Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. We had such a good time with our guest last week that we have invited him to stay for a second episode. And here to introduce him, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Uh, it doesn't get any better than this for a Broadway fan such as myself to have Charles Strauss with us at the piano. Thanks for sticking around for a second part of Theater Talk. We had such a great time. More and more. And I want to mention your uh, terrific memoir coming out um, uh, this summer, Put on a Happy Face, a Broadway memoir by Charles Strauss, which takes us through your life and career. And uh, When you were here last week, we, we just got up to... Um, Golden Boy. Uh, there's a show that you wrote around that time, too, that is a particular favorite of mine because it's, um, the, the villain in it is a, a Broadway gossip columnist. <laughs> <laughs> and I have uh, often identified with the Jack Cassidy role yeah. in It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman. Um, tell, tell me a little, I was always curious about the actor Jack Cassidy because he was really a, a great kind of Broadway leading man, the likes of which we don't see anymore. No, because well, he did such uh, uh, such wonderful comedy. He yeah. had, he was very good looking, but uh, had a satirical edge about himself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's as though he he was always kind of winky. You know, I'm just yeah. I'm, I'm making was, fun of myself. He was making fun of himself. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he was very uh, deep. I got to know Jack quite well before he died, and uh, he was very deep. He was very creative. He wrote a couple of plays, one of which uh, I read about. Uh, an Irish funeral, which seemed so opposite from the way he was. And uh, he was one of the actors who, who uh, with whom I'd opened up with, and he with me. And uh, uh, he was just a, a very, very nice man. On the end of um, uh, the, the last track of uh, uh, a re-release I have of It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman, you have a song that you wrote that didn't make it into the show. I think it was called Dot. Dot, dot, yeah, dot. it bombed in the theater, oh, really? and uh, because nobody understood what dot 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 meant. Mm. And yeah, I, I, I love it because yeah, it is it, it captures the spirit of oh, that Lee, kind of gossip column. The, writing. He, Lee was in the newspaper business, yeah, and yeah. Uh, he knew all these innuendos that Winchell and some of the columnists might not you, but some of the columnists might use. Right. But in the in um, it's a bird, it's a plane. You have my my favorite Charles Str Strauss song, Possibilities, which you wrote for Linda Lavin. That's And correct. that was the the song that really sent her on her on her way as a star. Uh, yeah. Would it, you do that for us, Possibilities? Uh, yeah. I've haircut, simply terrible necktie, the worst pairing, just unbearable. What to tackle first still You've got possibilities Maybe even a lot Red hot possibilities You don't even know you've got Bearing just enough I really came prepared for this <laughs> I'm not Victoria That hat has sure. to go still. You've got possibilities. It takes a woman to tell. Red hot possibilities. Why be shy and ill it is? You've got possibilities. You don't even know. When did you and Lee, because you wrote all these songs together, right? Uh, these musicals together, but then you, you kind of went away for a bit. You yeah. separated a bit. Yeah, as, as I remarked in Previous last second, month's yeah. show, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, the, 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 we still are the closest of friends, right. but uh, Lee, uh, my life was only working. I mean, I would just, uh, it's, that's not self-praise, it's just the reverse in a way. Whereas Lee led a different kind of life. He vacationed, he read a lot, and then he did something which su surprised me and made me very jealous, and that is he fell in love with a woman <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and, and got right. married, and uh, I, I felt uh, left out, yeah. you know, and uh, I would say that was the beginning of a, of a very uh, uh, affectionate separation, but nevertheless, 
you know, at, at 4.30 in the afternoon, I still wanted to do something. And uh, mm -hmm. so I started writing away from him, and he away from me, too, as far as that goes. And you but, wound up writing uh, what I guess is your biggest hit of all time, Annie. Yeah. Right? Um, yes. And, and uh, which you wrote with... Um, Martin Charnin, Martin Charnin of and course. Tom Meehan. And Tom, our, our good friend Tom Meehan. Yes. Now, I've heard the story that Martin Charnin was really sort of down on his luck at the time. Um, I think he was sleeping on a press agent's couch. He had no money. And yet what he did have was this idea for Annie, based yeah. on the comic strip. I, I'm not sure where he was sleeping. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm still not that sure. Uh, but, uh, yes, uh, he had, he was... Uh, he, he, he clung to this idea, and I didn't know Tom at the time, but uh, Tom thought about it. Tom, me, and the way I did, we thought it was, oh, what a terrible idea. Really? But why? What, 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 why? what did you well, see? Well, for me, it was uh, specifically because uh, a Superman hadn't worked. It got some wonderful notices. But also based did, on the cartoon. But it was based on a cartoon. And uh, that was the uh, one idea. The other idea was a little orphan girl uh, who, as it turned out when we reread the, uh, the cartoon, had no eyes. <laughs> she had a dog that had no eyes. Uh, it was hysterical at the beginning. And uh, uh, Martin's idea was to cast uh, uh, Bernadette Peters in the role. Really? And Yeah. And uh, uh, it, it, it was a great... It was a very difficult meeting of the minds, the, you know, the way river tri tributaries get together. Uh, but we started to uh, we remold it in the form of, of Dickens. Mm. And, uh, and we were both, particularly Tom, uh, uh, students of the Depression era and, uh, and, and had a feeling for politics. And that started to mold the thing, and it became an original story. And uh, it, uh, it went through the usual throes of, uh, of not succeeding. We did it at uh, Goodspeed Opera House, and the audiences were so-so, and uh, we kept working on it. We were all very hard workers, and they were mm -hmm. real pals. I mean, I love working, and they, and they did too. And uh, uh, we got it to a certain point. Walter Kerr came up to see it, mm -hmm. hated it. Really? And, and we said, well, this is the end. And wrote it in the front section of the New York Times. Oh, uh, he panned Annie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, it was a great pan, which he later apologized for, I must say, in all fairness to him. Uh, and, uh, but we read and reread his review uh, uh, as if it were the Talmud or something. I mean, we said, why did he say that? Why did he say that, and we made changes. Anyway, the show started to work and work, and one night, uh, one of my best friends, a woman by the name of Jay Presson Allen. Yeah, wonderful writer. A wonderful author herself, uh, came up to see it, because I, I knew her well enough that she would say, <coughs> close it, <laughs> and uh, she said, I think you have a hit here. And she called Mike, even though I knew Mike, Mike Nichols. Nichols. Yeah. Uh, I knew Mike, because he was one of the original uh, authors, uh, Putative authors of, of uh, Bye Bye Birdie. It didn't work out. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, the producer didn't like his and and uh, Nichols and Elaine's May, yeah. work. Elaine, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I knew him, but I wouldn't have the nerve to call him then. But she called him. She said, "If I can say this on your network," she said, "Get your ass down here, Mike." He, he was having a baby at the time, mm. uh, but uh, when she commands, uh, uh, people obey. And he came down and he liked it and he said, I want to produce So this. what did he bring to the table? He, didn't he have with Dorothy Loudon, Loudon, who was this, one of the great villains of all time, as Miss Hannigan? He, uh, he uh, cast, uh, uh, was able to get her yeah. to do yeah. it. But it was, it was really her husband's decision, if I'm to go into the detail. Her husband was a musician by the name of Norman Parrish, yes. or the nicest man, who used to employ me all the time. So we were good. When I was just starting out, he was doing a lot of concerts and fashion shows. And I was like number three guy. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, he said to Dorothy, it's a good score. I like the score. Oh, she wouldn't have, uh, have uh, no. done it. Did you write a song specifically for Dorothy? Did you write Easy Street for her or Hard Knock uh, Life? Or? Well, we, uh, no. Uh, the uh, I think we may have written uh, Little Girls with... No, no, we wrote that before she came in the show. Um, I, I, I don't... 
I don't remember to tell you the truth whether we wrote anything specific. I well, love she e made it all her own. Yeah, I, yeah, I love Easy Street. Could you give us a little Easy Street? Because uh, I can just see Dorothy bumping and grinding. Easy Street. the great, uh, the most famous song, one of the most famous songs really of all time, Tomorrow, yeah. from Annie. Can you, uh, before you give us a little of that, can you just tell us how you wrote that song specifically, what the idea was for it, you know, just where it came in the show? I'm just curious, the backstory of Tomorrow. Yeah, well, it's, uh, uh, to, to people who work a great deal in the theater, it won't seem uh, like a novel story, but it really was, because uh, that did not exist uh, at the beginning. And Martin Trunnan, who also directed the show, uh, she finds the dog, Sandy. She has an encounter with a policeman. And the next scene is sh they're back at the or orphanage with the thing. And th there was time needed uh, for her to uh, get there. I mean, the, the scene had been exhausted somehow by Tom. And... Uh, so we put a song in there really to uh, to span the time. The kill time. <laughs> and uh, it, we knew that she was a hopeful girl and yeah. all. And uh, we uh, and Martin had a very clever scene change. There was a, a, a billboard fence that went this way. And then when this came out, we were in the orphanage. And so, but we needed an extra two, three minutes. And that's when the song was written for that purpose. And uh, for months... It got a terrific hand the first time, mm. and I remember going in the back of the theater and saying to, to Martin, they, that scene change is fantastic. They <laughs> really love that, and uh, he he took you know bows for it, which of course it, it was, and it never didn't realize occurred. it was the song. <laughs> I never realized for months that, that, that people really liked the song, uh, uh, and of course it's been uh, it's been miraculous that. Uh, I mean, we we've had well, it's all all in the book. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. could you can you give us that song? I mean, argu oh. arguably your most famous <laughs> famous song. <laughs> Stuck with a dick that's gray and lonely. I just stick out my chin and grin and say, Oh, oh, oh. the sun will come out tomorrow, so you gotta hang on till.
I've heard that song so many times, but to hear you play, you realize what just how much more complicated that melody well, is. It's a than very complicated, which is a very funny thing. I mean, I know you're into this kind of thing in more detail than most people are, but I tried very hard to uh, reflect the 20s and 30s in mm -hmm. that show. But this and one other song, Hard Knock Life, yeah. were definitely not of the 20s. And I thought critics would call me on this particularly because the chords in there are very, uh, they're guitar chords. They're, they're very influenced by rock and yeah, very all that. Can, nobody ever said anything about it. They, uh, I don't think people really listen to, uh, you're one, I think you're the first person that ever mentioned that uh, actually to me. I was very... Uh, shy about that and thought that I was going to be uh, called on it. Now, right, this is a question that uh, someone who can't play the piano very well or is certainly not a composer, do you, do you hear sort of a river of melody in your head? I mean, is it just that a, a gift that you have that you, you hear songs that no one else has ever heard before? How does that work as a composer? Well, uh, I, I, I try and try to answer that question for myself in the book, but uh, I think I would speak for a lot of uh, composers perhaps, that uh, the idea of composing music is like um, reconstructing a dream. You can't do it, really. It has to kind of come to you. It's not inspiration, exactly, but there, there, uh, there are choices. Uh, you, you, th there's a note there, and uh, you, you, you kind of make a choice. I know this sounds a little no, over No, that's so interesting. No, it's fine. Please, please. You, for some reason that you'll never know, you do this next. Mm. See? And after that, there, there's a combination of, of sculpturing and unconsciously trying for another note which will uh, bring sunlight or, uh, or despair. And then... It, it, if you've ever tried to reconstruct a dream, and I have, mm. I mean, I've tried to remember them, I can't. I, I remember them over breakfast, and then that's the, that's the end of it. Uh, I, I think the best composers in the world are able, by not trying so hard, uh, to put together a string of notes that somehow relate to your unconscious or to somebody's unconscious. And after a while, if you're good at it, and I'm not, I work very hard to get uh, that, you get, you get lucky. I can't explain it. Mm. Uh, Could you give me just an example with Tomorrow, a melody we all know, yeah. if you're fooling around with it, where a place you could have gone with it that would make it sound different from what it became? I'm sure it could. But, uh, different character. Yeah, uh, uh, but I mean, you know, I'm a uh, jazz pianist, so it's nothing to me to kind of, I wouldn't call it high class improvisation, but I, I, certainly those are choices that I could have made and that it came out. And we didn't have any lyric. Oh, you wrote the melody first. Yeah. In fact, I did that always with the one exception with Martin. Charnin was uh, Hard Knock Life. He wrote that whole lyric first. And I said, I never heard that expression, Hard Knock Life. He assured me it was done in the 20s and 30s. But that was a, uh, I wrote that too. Otherwise, he liked me to write a, uh, a melody. And then, so, and then so that was the way that was done. Yeah, interesting. Um, there were a few shows that you wrote after Annie that uh, many people in the theater think have s some of the most beautiful music. Uh, ever written and that you've ever written for the for the stage, uh, but the shows didn't go. And I'm thinking of a, a score that I love, "Dance a Little Closer," yeah. which uh, I don't didn't last too long on Broadway. I don't believe. I would say 28 hours. <laughs> <laughs> that was about, that was about it. Uh, you wrote that with Alan J. Lerner, right? Yeah, it has. Uh, I wrote that with Alan, and uh, it was his last show. And uh, I don't know what to say about it except. Again, in, in the book, I would say there are very few rules in the theater, mm -hmm. but one of them that uh, might be uh, attended to is uh, do not work with a man who writes the book music, I mean the book lyrics, and, and directs it.
Yeah. Yeah. Do he was just too that. all over the he place, too. Yeah. Un- that's that's a, a no. But if he does all of those things and is in love with the leading lady at the same time, <laughs> that's a no-no. Cool. No. <laughs> that was Liz, uh, uh, Liz, Liz Robertson. Robertson. I yeah. think all objectivity is gone. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. And the other one, the other rule is don't never accept a pill from this man. Which <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> that's right. He was famous for being on sort of the yeah. Dr. Feelgood diet, uh, yeah, I think. I didn't, I didn't know that at the time it came. When we first started working together, I had a bad back, and he said, oh, Dear boy, he said, uh, I used to have that. I have just the thing for you, you know. And I just, so I took the pill. And 10 minutes later, I was praying for my family to come to attend to my death. That's how bad I felt. Uh, wow. Oh, uh, wow. Boy. Did you know when you were, Warner, yeah. you know, though, when you were writing the musical that it just wasn't going to go? Or when does no. it kind of dawn on you that the show you're well, involved in is, is not going to make it? things that he, uh, Len Carey, who is probably much more be- much better at, at saying these things. One of the things was that it, when indeed he, he said to me, look, he hadn't quite been married, but they were going to get married. <laughs> yeah. And he said, I promise you, dear boy, he was always calling me dear boy, that uh, if you don't think she's right, she's out of here. <laughs> and, and that was, uh, uh, Alan doesn't lie. He's known to be a liar, but he, uh, he, he never lied. But he was a very romantic man. He was the most romantic man I ever knew. When, yeah. when he loved a woman, he loved her so profoundly uh, and was so moved by uh, the sexual part of her and the fact I don't know, maybe it was because he was a little shorter than a lot of men. I, I don't know, I'm just making that up yeah, yeah. as I'm saying that. But uh, what he said about he will get rid of her, that turned out to be not true because she she wasn't right. She's a wonderful performer. She wasn't right for this part. And uh, one of the other parts that gave me pause was that he had an idea that uh, it takes place in an, in a uh, great hotel overlooking the Alps Mm -hmm. and he had an entire glass or actually was plexiglass window with a great view of uh, 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 the Alps and and the first time they put it up which somebody else would have known the lights blinded the audience it it just reflected (laughs) we couldn't find an angle where they could light the show and uh, uh, I, I thought uh, we're in for a little bit of a rough ride. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, we'll have to wrap it up in a minute, but he wrote some of the beautifully romantic songs you oh. wrote with him. And that, Thank Can you do the title song for us? Beautiful. Dance a little closer Like it used to be I need someone warm within my arms So please don't whirl away from me Dance a little closer We don't have to speak I just want to feel you near And softly hear you whisper in my cheek Explain. Can't we just pretend this is not a song for just the moment, but a song without an end? Dance a little closer. That, that's the best case that I, you can make for encores to uh, to do dance a little closer. Oh, I think. I love just to, it. Uh, Charles Strauss, it's been great having you on the show with us. Just really it's terrific for, for me and I hope and for Susan, Susan too. Oh, <laughs> your memoir is Put on a Happy Face, uh, a Broadway memoir by Charles Strauss. Your publisher is? The Sterling. Sterling. And it's out this summer. So pick it up and, uh, you know, we should always have a Charles Strauss album on your uh, on your turntable i think thanks Thank a lot you. for being our guest and we have a request from uh, bob isaacson who runs cuny studios for us if you would play us out with his favorite song of yours nyc oh my great pleasure mm-hmm.